Frank. Um, as Frank said, um, my name is Jenny West. I work at Family Means as the community educator in our caregiving and aging department. I'll try to talk loud too if this goes out. Uh, and what we do is we help the caregiver. We help individuals who are caring for somebody else, whether it be a partner, a spouse, an older adult, um, and even young children um, who might have a diagnosis. Um, and one of our big education points is all around the dementia diagnosis. Um, as we know, Kim is going to be my little button switcher. Um, here in Minnesota, um, Individuals are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's each and every day. Um, the older you get, the higher chance that you might receive a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, these stats are taken, um, as you can read them, one out of nine individuals over the age of 65 have, a, have an Alzheimer's diagnosis and it continues to increase as you age. The one thing that I want to bring you uh, to look at is to be aware that this is specifically only for an Alzheimer's diagnosis because we're going to go into um, other diagnoses that are uh, that do have a cognitive decline. Um, just to let you know too, in Stillwater there are we were able to do based on population there are over a thousand individuals who have a diagnosis with Alzheimer's and of those approximately 125 are living home alone still and trying to manage all of the day-to-day -day tasks um, that are required. So some of the challenges that you may see um, in your own neighborhood or even in your work um, can be evident each and every day. And somebody with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, aside from telling you, you may not know and they may not share that they actually have that diagnosis. Um, so it's something to really be aware of. So as you hear me say, the L's, I often try to just use the word dementia. Um, people often will say, I have a dementia diagnosis or I have dementia. And in fact, dementia is actually the umbrella term. It's known as the collection of symptoms that turn into an actual diagnosis. Um, and so if you can picture dementia as kind of the umbrella, Alzheimer's, an Alzheimer's diagnosis falls underneath that along with about 60 other different diagnoses. So that's why I wanted you to think about for the Alzheimer's diagnosis, it is, Alzheimer's is the most well-known disease out there, but there are many other dementia diagnoses that fall under that umbrella. Dementia is not a part of normal aging, <coughs> but yet we often think that. And with all of our advancements of research um, and medical technology and assessments and so forth, we are able to diagnose a dementia diagnosis earlier. Two decades ago, it was upon autopsy. Now they can compare um, CAT scans and MRI scans um, to other brains to see if there is a comparable difference, you know, that the brain has actually shrunk, that they can actually see that. Um, and then also through family interviews. You know, what symptoms are you seeing? What behaviors um, brought you here today? Oftentimes when you think about a diagnosis of, of a dementia diagnosis, when it's given, it's probably several months, maybe even years after the fact when their first symptoms have started. Oftentimes we'll hear families be a little bit relieved to hear the Alzheimer's diagnosis because they're like, oh, now it makes sense. It makes sense. Three years ago, when my mom was caught shoplifting at Target. What? My mom doesn't shoplift, you know? But she just got news that she was a grandma for the first time, and she was going to see that granddaughter. So she went to Target to buy everything in pink possible, was so excited thinking about this grandbaby that she's going to meet, walked right outside of Target and forgot to pay. So oftentimes, when law enforcement does become involved, it's shoplifting and not necessarily speeding, but driving too slow on the highway. And you'll receive the argument, but I'm being safe. People are driving too fast. No, you're actually more at risk if you can't, if you can't go 55 miles per hour. You know, you decide to go 35. Um, I'm also hearing about the roundabouts. 
how they are actually increasing the flow of traffic and making things a little bit quicker. But the, the quick decision-making skill of merging and staying on in the right road, especially if it's a two-lane roundabout, um, has actually increased some accidents. So just to kind of be aware of that. The next slide. The next slide will actually show my definition of the dementia umbrella. Again, those are the symptoms. And underneath it are various diagnoses. And if I can stress one thing today is if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. Everybody exhibits differently with their diagnosis. Um, a few of them, just, just to tell you kind of some of the big differences, Alzheimer's, as we know a lot of information, is kind of that constant progressive decline over years. Not weeks, not months, but over years. Um, however, a vascular dementia, um, very similar with a stroke, it happens. The deficits are there, and there may be no longer the ability to get those back. And so those, de those deficits remain. Um, Parkinson's is very similar too. It's kind of like, a, I, I say it's like a step. You know, maybe there's some progression and then all of a sudden they plateau for a while and then just a random, a random fall, a urinary tract infection can cause another decline and then another plateau. Lily body dementia, um, actually fairly common, their memory stays intact but they experience hallucinations. And oftentimes those hallucinations are not scary to them, but they're alarming to the people that they're telling us. Did you see all of the children that were playing in my room? They made a mess of my house last night. I can't believe those children. And those children were never there. Or don't you see the gentleman sitting next to me in the chair in the corner? I don't know what he's doing. He's just sitting there. They're not alarmed, but yet we might be alarmed. Young onset Alzheimer's dementia is clearly being diagnosed before the age of 65, which is actually on the rise right now. But again, a lot of these are on the rise because we're learning more and more about them. Frontal temporal dementia often de um, is described as really intense high and low behaviors. Um, maybe they're really, really happy, really, really mad. They kind of swing back and forth and their ability to um, be rational is very difficult. And they don't understand, they don't see the problems that they're exhibiting. Um, one woman shared earlier this spring that her father lost her, his driver's license. He was like, okay, that's fine. His wife was still working, he had retired early. His wife went to work at nine o'clock in the morning. He took a taxi to the airport, bought a plane ticket, went to Kansas, tried to buy a Bose, jet, some airline, like an airplane, had to, and was to the final step that he actually had to call his wife to get a verbal approval to purchase the jet. Not a problem, call my wife, here's her work number. Called, and the wife said, excuse me, where is he? Where are you? He's trying to buy an airplane to compensate that he had lost his driver's license. Doesn't know, but he didn't know how to drive an airplane. So kind of that rationale. Um, it can be very different. And I just want to tell you these because, at, again, once you meet somebody with a dementia, you've only met one person. It really does vary from, um, from person to person. And what happens with any of the dementias is that there's a cognitive decline in one of these following domains. Now oftentimes, and I should have asked, when I say the word Alzheimer's, what do you think of? People forgetting something. And absolutely, memory is included in every single dementia at some point in, in that dementia journey, but it's not necessarily the first thing to go. Oftentimes, individuals with Alzheimer's, maybe they still have the ability to drive very, very well, but they can't calculate their, um, their checkbook. Maybe they're not doing really good with numbers. Um, language is a very big factor when you think of all of the communication that, you, that we do, that everybody does, and if they're not able to recall a certain object, a certain name, you're gonna see that decline. But in some of the different diagnoses, it's more prevalent 
in a specific diagnosis than, an, than another. Um, so there are a lot of variations. Decision making, that ability to stay focused on a task um, is really important. Reasoning abilities, um, kind of like the gentleman who wanted to buy that plane to offset his driver's license. Um, so really, everybody is different. And you might see a deficit. It's not that everyone has a decline in every single domain. It may hit one domain more than another. And that's why you hear people who have a, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's still being able to drive because they probably haven't lost that domain. They haven't lost that ability yet. They've lost other things. It's not all or none. And oftentimes, too, people think, and we all jump, we all jump to it, they're going to forget my name. We don't accept the individual where they are. We tend to jump to the later stages, but we don't let the person allow, we don't allow them to stay in the stage that they're at. So we kind of put that notion in that they can't do anything, and yet they still can do a lot of things. Um, and that's why I'm here today, is to bring that awareness and that education, whether it's you have somebody in your family with a diagnosis, in your neighbor, or even the um, patrons that visit you at work. Next. So the warning signs, the next two slides, the next um, 10 bullet points are just kind of the cues and those, oh yeah, mom has had a hard time with this lately. Does it mean that she has Alzheimer's? We're not quite sure, but what should you do? Um, because we all make mistakes, right? Did everybody really know that today was Thursday? Especially with Labor Day, has everybody, you know, even myself today, I'm like, really? Today's Thursday, not Wednesday? Because I've only been to work for three days. You know, where it takes us kind of that orientation. We all make mistakes. Who in this room has not, or who, well, who hasn't forgotten to pay their bill? Whether they simply deleted it in their inbox, or they recycled that bill until the next month. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot that bill. You know, some of those things are common for us. And we can recall that. We can say, oh yeah, I didn't pay July's electric bill. Some people, maybe with a diagnosis of dementia, they, they're not able to trace back even a month or even maybe a week. Um, and so they forget that. Um, it's really important too for routines for individuals with a any kind of dementia diagnosis, having a steady routine um, can really keep some calmness um, and increase their independence. Confusion with time or place. We all can probably listen to a song that we heard on the radio on the way over and it brings us back to maybe the, our wedding dance or you know a particular song has some really important meaning to you and you can go back to that memory and then you can walk through these doors and come to the chamber meeting. Somebody with a dementia diagnosis has a harder time with that transition because they're back on their wedding day and they're enjoying that memory and it's a great memory and so they're gonna live in that memory. It takes them, it could take them a lot longer to realize that this is actually 2018 um, and not on their wedding day. Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. Um, and I'll use Frank's um, barber shop um, because a lot of times when you think of the barber, there's a lot of mirrors. The person is not facing you face to face, you're standing behind them. And then you come in with a scissors or a razor and they're, they might be startled with that noise. And then the floor could be that glossy floor. For individuals with a dementia diagnosis in the middle to later stages, that glossy floor actually looks wet. And they won't challenge you, like, Frank, mop up your floor. They'll just assume that that's wet and they'll walk around it. Um, even the black mats that we have in the front door to stop snow and sand, if you are at a restaurant or even out at the Mall of America, you, you can literally watch people walk around them because they think it's a hole. So it's visually not being able to say, like, there shouldn't be a hole in this front, in the front entryway, but it's okay, I'm just gonna walk around it. Um, when you look at this room, you can definitely see where the wall ends and the floor begins because of the contrast with the carpet and the wood. If you go to the Mall of America or Ikea and try to figure out where you are, that's major disorientation. 
especially the new area of the Mall of America where it's all white. The walls are white, the floors are white. That can be very, very disconcerting for somebody. Um, in the later stages with a dementia diagnosis, the vision, actually you lose your peripheral and you just start coming into who's in front of you. That's why it's always recommended to come face to face um, so you don't startle that person. Misplacing things, we all do it. But we're able to realize, oh yeah, when I came in, where are my car keys? That's right. My son had a major accident. I threw him down, you know, when I was doing laundry, they're on top of the dryer. I go back to the dryer, I find my car keys. Yep, that's right. For somebody with a dementia diagnosis, they may not be able to retrace that step. And oftentimes, this is where I hear a lot of arguments. If she would just stop putting her purse somewhere else, you know, because <laughs> then, she, the, perhaps the husband or partner, you know, gets yelled at, why do you keep on moving my purse? I don't, you do. But they're trying to keep it in that safe spot. Um, so again, we go back to having that routine is really, really important. And withdrawal from work or social activities. Um, I actually run a memory club series where we have the caregivers and the individual with a diagnosis come together for an hour of education and then an hour of peer support. And that peer support for the individuals with the dementia is so important because they can talk and say, gosh, does this ever happen to you? Oh my gosh, all the time. And they know it normalizes them. And it's a safe place for individuals to talk um, about that diagnosis because I don't want anybody to treat me different. I don't want my neighbors or my barber to treat me any different. I just need a little bit more help. What can I do? What can they do to keep me where I am in those earlier stages? Or even if they're in the later stages, still, how can we keep them as independent um, as, possible? as possible? How can we empower them? So those are kind of the warning signs of, of the losses. And we often think about Alzheimer's and any dementia as a loss, and it certainly is. There's a cognitive deficit. There are no cures right now. But we also have to remember what remains. What skills does that individual have? Um, and I have to tell you that I've been to a share of, my fair share of funerals um, over the past seven years of individuals who have died um, with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And I never knew them before. I only knew them where they were with their diagnosis. And every time I sit and I hear the stories from the family members, I think to myself, that is the same person I knew. And I only knew him for four years. And here he's 85. That's the same characteristics that I would describe if I was speaking of him. Their social well-being, their manners, their humor remains the same. Oftentimes their ability to read our body language actually heightens. So when we think we're being snide and sarcastic, but we say it in a loving way, oh, they're picking up on it. And they will often respond the way you respond to them. They will mirror your behaviors, and that's the response that they'll be given. So if you're distracted, if you're talking loud, they will probably try to reach you and talk loud, and they were, they'll already be distracted. So being, you know, being very aware of that, that you want to try to minimize as much of the environmental um, distractions as possible. Their social graces um, and music is absolutely amazing. A lot of times, especially with the dementia um, aphasia, atypical aphasia, they lose the ability to communicate, but you put on their favorite song, they're able to sing. There's something about music that really is within the so deep in your hippocampus that it just, it retains. It's within their body. Um, and that they're able to, and oftentimes we'll see people have conversations in song, um, instead to allow that ability to talk and to keep that communication going. So don't be afraid of using music. Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that's true with any dementia diagnosis. The content of what you're saying, they may not be able to recall, the stories that you say, the updates that you might give them, 
they may not remember until the next day, or they may not be able to repeat it, but the ability of the how you make them feel in that time, in that presence, um, is truly a gift. So, the next few slides we have, what can we do as an individual? And then I'm also gonna touch base on what do you do at work? You know, what are some of those possibilities? And the first one is responding to the emotion and not the behavior. I'm guessing that you probably all have some pretty good stories of an irate customer. You know, how did you handle that situation? Did you try to keep them out in the open or did you try to bring them to a quieter place just so they could calm down? Whether they had a di diagnosis of dementia or not. But responding to their emotions, wow, I see that you're really mad. I would be mad too. Can we go talk over here? Wow, you really are angry because we're out of stock on X, Y, and Z. My deepest apologies. Can I get your name and number and I'll call you as soon as it comes back into stock? I'll deliver it to your house, you know? What are those things? But responding to actually to their behavior or to their emotions is really important. Focusing on their remaining skills <coughs> as well as being the memory maker. I have to be honest, I introduce myself to my own family <laughs> because I'm so used to saying, my name is Jenny West, I work at family meetings. I've seen you at my memory cafes. I've seen you at my you know, blah, 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 blah class. I always am that memory maker because chances are I have a better memory because I know that person might have a diagnosis of dementia and they might see me out of context. They might see me at Target or at church or even at family means but not remember that they saw me the previous week. So I become the memory maker. We don't say, don't you remember? What's your favorite thing that you do at the cabin? What was that occupation that you did, Dad? No, oh, Dad, you worked at Control Data for 45 years, and you did something with really small parts. What was that? Oh, they were chicks, blah, 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 you know. I'm gonna set him up for success. I'm going to start creating that foundation of the memory, and then let them ask in an open-ended question, ask them to contribute as much as they can. One, you're starting to make that memory, but two, you're also giving them time to transition. Dad, I'm gonna talk about your work. Okay, she's gonna talk about my work. I need to process that. I'm gonna try to work as hard as I can to get back to my working memories. And so by you creating that foundation can get them to that memory a lot quicker. So you're creating moments for success. You're empowering them and you're including them in opportunities. Um, I had one couple that she loves to cook, he loves to clean up after the, you know, after. And what would happen is she would cook, she would use every bowl and plate, it was fine, they would eat and he would clean. He would wash the dishes and put everything away. Well, when he put everything away, like there was just an empty space. So of course the coffee pot goes up in the cupboard because there's empty space and it fits. So that's my rationale. And of course the plates would go into a drawer because they're flat and the drawer is thin and flat. And so that was his rationale. So he would put things all in various places. So then the wife would come back at the next meal to cook and she's like, where is everything? And she got really, really frustrated. But instead of stopping him by cleaning because he still did a really good job, she said, wash and dry them, put them all on, the, in the, on top of the cupboard I will put everything away. So she's meeting him where he's at. And she's having a lot less frustration the next time that she cooks a meal. But yet they're still able to take team and do that work together. So really looking at their abilities on what they can do. Because um, again, we tend to jump to the eight to 10 years down the road. We don't live in the now. An attempt to find humor if possible We've got a lot of stress when it's caregiving related, especially with a dementia journey because it can be long. So finding that humor and that ability to laugh is really important. Um, I've talked about this. Sometimes it's not what we say, it's how we say it. So really being aware of your body language, your tone, your volume, and being able to get their attention right off the bat. A lot of couples say, yep, we no longer can talk room to room. That's the hardest thing. I need to change my communication. I can't yell for him to get something. 
I've got to go into that room and ask him so I know that he has my attention. You're never going to win an argument. Don't even try. It's not worth it. Just say yes and. Yep, the Packers are the best. And I'm still going to root for the Vikings. <laughs> Next. Successful communication occurs um, when you give them your time. I think that diagnosis of any kind of dementia, really what it helps for us, it allows us to slow down and meet the individual where they're at. We are a fast-paced society. We are go, go, go. You have all already thought about what you're doing tonight and this weekend, guaranteed. But for somebody with a dementia diagnosis, we need to be in the here and now. We have to stop all of our multitasking. We have to center on, center on them and focus on them. And they will be able to feel that. In your businesses, what can you do? What would be really important um, that could help somebody with a dementia diagnosis? You know, come take, take a look. Walk through your front doors. Are, are there signage that makes sense to you? Again, I use IKEA. I get lost in IKEA. I'm scared of going in there. So what does your what does your building look like? What is your lighting? What is, you know, do you have glassy floors? You might have them. Maybe you could add a couple of rugs to, you know, take that glare off of it. Do you have windows um, or door windows? I'm not gonna lie, I've run into glass doors before too out in the community. It's pretty embarrassing. Put a plant in front of it. You know, you're still letting the light in, but you're, you're saying there is clearly a wall here. This is not a door. Offer those quiet areas, if possible, or at least have a designated area if somebody does need time to cal calm down. If you're able to do any kind of reconstruction, looking at unisex bathrooms has really been important, especially in restaurants um, where individuals, where the husband and wife Maybe one of them needs assist, assistance in the bathroom, and they're not able to because you've got a, ma a male bathroom and a female bathroom. So kind of being aware of that. Um, and being mindful of clutter is really important. How to help. Share your stories with one another. You know, maybe that could be an opportunity. What, what has worked with your, within your business might work within some, in someone else's. Um, responding to the look of distress that they might have and simply, may I help you, can really engage somebody to be like, oh, okay, they're here for me, yes, I need, I need this. Um, I've seen many, I've seen a family um, in a yarn shop, it was a grandma, a mother, and a daughter, and the grandmother kept on walking in the back of the cash register, and the daughter kept on getting mad. And the owner went up and said, can I help you? And she just went like this. And she's like, do you need a tissue? Yeah. All she needed was a Kleenex. So she was looking underneath the, the cash register for a Kleenex. Um, but the daughter didn't know that. The daughter was trying to get the yarn and keep the younger, her daughter, you know, occupied. Um, so just simply asking is really important. Providing education and resources. You know, you might be a trusted bank employee or you know your customers. You know, if they confide in you, what are you able to do? What information are you able to share? You don't have to know the answers, but try to connect them to somebody in Oakdale. Try to connect them. You can use the Minnesota Senior Linkage Line as a first stop shop. You can call us at Family Means and we'll connect them. Um, we just don't want anyone to feel alone and by themselves. Um, and just getting involved and sharing your knowledge, talking about Alzheimer's. You know, they used to say the big C word was cancer three decades ago. And now, if you hear somebody with a cancer diagnosis, oh, what's your stage? What's your therapy? What are you doing? There's a lot more positivity around it. What are you going to do? Well, now we're kind of seeing that with the A word of Alzheimer's. People are scared to talk about it. It's not contagious. It's an opportunity to bring up a discussion. What can I do for you right now? Where are you at? What kind of help do you need? Um, and we're here to do that. I did put on your tables just some information from the Act on Alzheimer's about um, dementia friendly in community settings, um, as well as in your neighborhood. Feel free to take those home. Um, and I'll be around if you have any questions.
I'm happy to answer them. Are there any questions right away? Yes. Do you have any uh, bullet point tips for supporting spouses or other support family that are dealing with a family member that's had? Some supporting tips. Know who is on your team. If you can designate roles, like, okay, it's a husband and wife and you've got three kids, what strengths, what do those three kids want to do? I literally have in my family, I am literally helping to do personal cares with my dad when he needs them, and my brother is gonna do my taxes. We have it all worked out. Because my brother wants nothing to do with any kind of personal cares, and that's my comfort zone. So talking to your entire family, and your family might be by blood, but it also might be neighbors. It might be extended help and community supports that you already use. But start doing a checkoff list. Who can do what, and what do they feel comfortable with? And who is your mother going to call at 3 AM? That's really important, because oftentimes when a crisis occurs, it's after 5 p.m. or on the weekend at 3 a.m. Who can your mom call that will have the phone nearby to pick up to step in and help out? And asking them, do you need a break? What else can we do? Have family meetings, even when you don't need them, just so everybody has the same information. Doesn't mean that everybody has to be on the same page, but they've all been given the same information.